In this video, we'll look at Z transform methods for LTI systems described by linear difference equations. LTI systems, uh, in particular discrete time LTI systems, are described by linear difference equations. This is a standard form for a linear difference equation. We have all the Y terms on the left. The Y terms represent the output of the system. And we have all the X terms on the right side. Uh, the X terms are the input to the system. So each term has a coefficient. For example, A0 goes with Y sub N, Y of N. Uh, A1 goes with Y of N minus 1, A2 with Y of N minus 2, and so forth. And then on the right side, we, have, we use B for the uh, coefficients. So we have B0 X of N plus B1 X of N minus 1, and so on. So we're going to show in this video how Z transform methods can be used to find the following for the system. First of all, we're going to find the transfer function by inspection. From the transfer function, we can find the system impulse response, H of N. We're going to determine the system stability. Uh, is it stable or not? And finally, we will solve the difference equation using Z transform methods and this represents the system output for a given system input X of N. So let's go ahead and work through an example to show all of these methods. Suppose that we're given a causal LTI system um, is described by the following linear difference equation. Y of N minus one half Y N minus one equals X of N plus one third x of n minus 1, and the input of the system x of n is given to us as 1 fourth to the n times the step function u of n. All right, so the first thing we can do is find the transfer function of this system by inspection. So we've done this in a previous video. So um, just by looking at the coefficients here of our linear difference equation, we can write h of z. So remember that on the uh, top here, the numerator, that's determined by the x coefficients here. So x of n gives us a 1, and we have plus 1 third, uh, and then a delay of 1 gives us z to the minus 1. Uh, in the denominator, we look at the y coefficients. So y of n gives us a 1, and we have a minus 1 half, and then the delay of 1 here, y of n minus 1, gives us the factor of z to the minus 1 at the bottom. So here is our our transfer function uh, written directly by inspection of the difference equation. Um, <clears throat> we can clean this up a little bit, and if we multiply the top and bottom by z to get rid of these negative powers of z, um, we see that the, the top we get z plus one third, and on the bottom we get z minus one half. So here is our, our transfer function in its simplest form. The next thing we're gonna do here is construct a pole zero ROC plot for the transfer function, H of Z. We know that the system is causal, so the region of convergence must be outside of the outermost pole. So first of all, we can just by inspection here, we can look at our transfer function, and we can see that we have a zero when Z is equal to minus one third, that's the numerator, setting the numerator to zero. So we'll plot that here, here's our zero. And we have a pole when z is equal to 1 half. That's by setting the denominator equal to zero. So we have a real pole on the real axis here at z equals 1 half. And again, uh, because the system is causal, we know that the ROC has to be outside of the pole. That's one of the properties of causal systems. Um, the other thing we can do now is figure out if the system is stable or not. And remember the rule there is the, the, the what, what we're looking for is, is the unit circle inside of the region of convergence. And so here is um, the value one over here. So the unit circle is certainly going to be outside of this pole and it is in the region of convergence. So therefore we can conclude that the system is stable. All right, we'll continue on here. So the next thing we can do is find the impulse response H of N um, of the system. And to do this, we're just going to take our transfer function h of z, and we're going to do an inverse z transform. And this is something that we have discussed in a previous video. 
So what we can do here, remember our uh, uh, <clears throat> all right, our transfer function um, is z plus one third over z minus one half, and we can do uh, a partial fraction expansion. Um, actually, this is uh, very simple in this case because uh, we have uh, the first term is just z over z minus one half, and the second term we just use this uh, one third here. We have one third over z minus one half. So we've split our transfer function into two pieces. Now the problem here is that this second term is um, a form that corresponds to a left-sided signal. So if you look back at um, our transform pairs for right-sided signals and left-sided signals, a left-sided signal has a form of some constant, or a, over z minus a. And that's, that's this form here. So this term would actually correspond, you know, especially if you um, convert this one third into a one half by multiplying by two thirds out in front, uh, we pick up a minus sign. And so this, this form here would correspond to the signal negative two thirds times one half to the n times u of minus n. The problem here is this is a left-sided signal and we know that our impulse response has to be a right-sided signal because the system is causal. So we can fix this by forcing this term to look like a right-sided signal. Now, how do we do this? Well, let's take the one-third and put it out in front. So that leaves a one on top. Well, we can replace the one with a z times z to the minus one, since those two terms basically cancel each other. So the trick here is what we've done is the, the term in parentheses now is the form z over z minus a, and that is exactly the form for a right-sided sequence. So now we've got our two terms here uh, for our transfer function, and they both correspond to right-sided sequences. So the next step now is to perform the inverse z transform just by inspection. Uh, the first term is, is straightforward. We just compare this term here to our transform pair here, and by inspection, we see that a is equal to one half. So this um, term is going to be one half to the n times u of n. Now the second term, the part in the parentheses here corresponds to basically the same signal as we had over here. It would be one half to the n times u of n. But out in front, we have two things. First of all, we have a coefficient of one third all right, so that's easy. We just, we'll just put that one third out in front here. But the z to the minus one, what that does is that corresponds to a time shift. Remember, this is the time shifting property. If you have a z to the minus one, that means that the signal or the sequence has been delayed by one. So that refers to x of n minus one. So what we have here for our second term, instead of one half to the n times u of n, we have one half to the n minus one times u of n minus one. So together, these two terms here um, form our impulse response for this system. All right, the next step is to um, finally figure out what is the solution of this linear difference equation. In other words, what is the output of this system for the given input? All right, so we're gonna do this um, by using Z transform methods. So remember from the problem statement, we were given the input of the system was one fourth to the n times u of n. So again, we can use this transform pair right here for right-sided signals. And by inspection, we can see that um, a in this case is one fourth. So our transform is gonna be z over z minus one fourth. So this is x of z. This is the z transform um, of the input. And uh, we can use um, the relationship between output, input, and transfer function, in other words, y equals x times h, to write the transform of the output. So we have h of z, remember that's up here, z plus one third over z minus one half, and we're gonna multiply that by z over z minus one fourth, which is x. So put together, um, here is the uh, z transform of our output y, it's z, times z plus one third over z minus one half times z minus one fourth. Now, the last step 
is to do the inverse Z transform to convert this in the frequency domain back into our sequence Y of N in the time domain. So uh, obviously we can't do that in this form. We don't have a, a table uh, for this type of form. So the trick as always is to break this thing up using partial fractions into little pieces that we can transform or inverse transform by inspection. So um, one uh, little problem here is you'll notice that we have a power of Z squared. The, you know, this is a second order polynomial in Z in the numerator. We also have the same second order polynomial in the denominator. So we can't do partial fractions um, as is, but there's a trick here. We can take this Z out in front and put it out in front and put everything else in brackets. And this uh, term in brackets here, we're gonna be able to expand this using partial fraction expansion, which is shown on the next slide. Okay, so again, here is our result from the last slide for the output y of z. And remember, we've taken that uh, z and brought it out in front. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do partial fraction expansion of the term inside this, of the uh, uh, results here inside the square brackets. So um, we're gonna split it up into two pieces, a over z minus one half, that takes care of this term down here. And then the other part is z minus one fourth. So we'll call that b, uh, the coefficient over z minus one fourth. And again, um, I don't show the details here, but we've done partial fraction expansion um, several times in this chapter and other chapters up till now. So I'm assuming that you know how to do partial fraction expansion. And um, it turns out that the coefficient A um, ends up being 10 thirds, and the coefficient B ends up negative 7 thirds. So here, um, here it is all expanded out. So now that we have, um, it, in this form, what we can do is take this Z that was out in front and distribute it back inside. So this first term then becomes 10 thirds times Z over Z minus one half, and the second term becomes seven thirds times Z over Z minus one fourth. Um, before we do our um, inverse Z transform, we can uh, construct another pole zero plot for the output Y of Z. Uh, so using either of these forms, it's probably easiest to use this form up here. We can get the zeros. For example, we see there's a zero at zero. So that's plotted right here. There's another zero at Z equals negative one third. That's plotted over here. And then um, what's more important is to plot the poles. We see we have a pole at Z equals one half. That's plotted right here. And the other pole at Z equals one fourth, which is right here. All right, now, the region of convergence um, is going to be outside of the outermost pole. Uh, remember, this is a causal system, and therefore, Y of N, our output sequence, must be a right-sided sequence. And uh, this, this pole here is the pole farthest from the origin, so this is the region of convergence out here. So finally, knowing that Y of N is a right-sided sequence, we can use this same transform pair again, um, that is Z over Z minus A, inverse transforms back to A to the N times U of N. So by inspection, looking at Y of Z up here, we have 10 thirds out in front right here. Um, our A is one half, so we have one half to the N times U of N. And then for our second term here, we have negative seven thirds, so that's shown right here. And again, by inspection, we have um, A equals one fourth for this term. So it's one fourth to the N times the step function U of N. And so this is the um, output of our system for that particular input.